in the name of the Lord. Come on, God, give me the buzz. I was joking around. I was daring God. They finished praying, and, and Ben says, the guy we were praying for didn't get the buzz he was looking for. My heart stopped. He spoke to me that night, and he said, when you're serious, I'm going to scream out the name of Jesus, and he'll save you. And I remember what Ben said, and I screamed out, Jesus, Jesus, help me, save me. The very second I did that, If you don't believe in miracles, then don't believe in me, because I am one. I felt the buzz. <laughs> Welcome back to our special program, Life Beyond the Grave. In a recent Harris poll, 69% of Americans said they believe in hell, while only 1% thought they were going there. Yet Jesus said, the highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose the easy way. You are now going to meet people who have had a first-hand encounter with hell. They chose poorly and weren't ready for eternity. Each experienced a place of incredible terror and came back with an urgent message to warn as many people as they could about eternal darkness. Tamara LaRue, as a teenager, killed herself with a 38 caliber bullet to the chest, and she died. She became blind, then deaf, then felt her soul leave her body. That's when she began to fall and fall and fall until she landed in a place of fire. I was convinced that there was no way to live a completely happy life. And if I couldn't live happy, I didn't want to live at all. It began with a divorce, a broken home. And I believe that through that, my mentality began to form and began to develop a sense of rejection because I didn't understand. I was a small child and didn't understand adult things. And so I, I felt the breakup was all about me. That sense of rejection just really grew. I began to perceive myself as a burden to other people. And so I would take little bitty comments that were relatively insignificant. I would make it into a really big deal. Those little seeds in my life, I began meditating on over and over. And as I grew, the rejection began to grow. What is wrong with me? And so I believe that the only answer for me was to end my life. I walked um, to my mother's room thinking I don't want anyone to see me because I'm so determined to end my life, to end the void, to end the suffering, to end the loneliness that nothing was going to stop me. I began crying out and I began screaming out to God, God, forgive me. And the gun went off. My lungs began to fill up with blood. My ears, I began to become deaf, very slowly, faintly become deaf. My eyes became blind. My eyes were open and I became blinded and I knew that death was gripping my soul. And then all of a sudden, I felt myself, my soul leave my body and I instantly began falling and falling. And at that moment, I knew I was no longer in control of my destiny. And I ended up in a place that was complete torment. And my body was burning. I no longer was lonely. I was no longer depressed. I became depression. I became loneliness. I became a tormented being of fear. And as I began looking out and I saw all of these other people and everybody was screaming in pain, the, the mutual thing that everyone shared there was their desire to scream out to everybody, 
on earth. Do not come here. Acknowledge that life is about Jesus Christ. Eternity is real and hell is real and heaven is real and how you live your life will determine where you go. And everybody cried out that their loved ones would hear the truth. I saw the hand of God literally come down. And at that moment, I knew that He was coming for me and His hand picked me up. And instantaneously, I was no longer a being of tormented sin. I now was a being being cleansed. And God took me over the heavens. It was beyond peaceful and gorgeous and magnificent. However, I was not allowed to stay and I was certainly not allowed to see anything specific. But I was able to feel His presence in His entirety. I was able to feel perfect serenity. I was able to feel joy for the first time, complete, whole joy. And this hand just began to bring me back into the universe. And I saw myself coming back to my home and went through the ceiling and the hand just went and placed me gently back into my physical body. And he went up and I opened my eyes and I saw him go up. And instantly I knew at that moment, God loved me. I called out on his name and I asked for him to forgive me and he did. And at that moment I was given a spiritual strength that I had never known. I was given joy that I had never had. I was given peace that I knew would take me through what I was about to face. The bullet had missed my heart um, by less than a fourth of an inch, I mean just you know by millimeters there and had explained that you know the pressure of a 38 caliber gun should have exploded my heart and they didn't understand that there was nothing wrong with me. They had broke a few of my ribs and that was all. When you leave this earth, you are going to do one or two things. Either you are going to be transformed into a being of sin and torment, or you are going to be transformed into a being of light and love and joy. And it is a personal responsibility who and what you are going to be transformed into. And I had to learn how to take on the responsibility and quit blaming others for my mental and emotional condition. Now I'm full of joy. Now I am full of peace. I am who God says I am. I am loved. I am adopted into the kingdom of Christ. You know, God sees me that I am His child and all that He has is mine. I just have to be able to receive it. And I have to be able to recognize and replace my junk with His greatness. As long as I stand on the promises of God and I allow His presence in my life, I can conquer anything and I can go through my problems with peaceful sleep. I can go with them with joy and strength beyond all comprehension. And I can come out on the other side full of hope and a victory in Christ. Tamara is right. When you leave this earth, one of two things is going to happen to you. You will either be with Jesus in heaven or you'll spend eternity in hell. Now, what is hell all about? As I read the Bible, I came across something that was absolutely awful. It says they will be tortured day and day and night and day forever. And I thought, your body in hell can't die. And the torture will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. I can't conceive of anything as awful. You know, if they torture you here on earth, you die and the torture is over. But not with your spirit. A lake of fire that burns forever. Now, what does the Bible say about this? It says in Revelation, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. No one, no one should ever go there. No one should ever want to go there. It is horrible 
beyond imagination. Well, you and I are born into a world at war. There's a spiritual battle going on right now for your soul. The struggle is real, and the enemy is fierce. Meet Randy Hicks. As he lay dying, he felt someone dragging his soul out of his body. Then he met the enemy face to face, and he saw hell in its eyes. I just knew that I was going to hell, and I knew that was the enemy that came for me, because when I looked up, I looked right into his face and eyes, and it, it was so huge, it was almost looked like a fallen angel, and he had the horns of a ram, and it was horrible. When I looked into his eye sockets, it was like looking into death and hell. The best way I can describe it, it was a darkness within a darkness. Randy Hicks' drug use and his eventual overdose had kept him living in darkness since early in his childhood. He grew up one of nine children in rural Illinois with little parental supervision. I got high when I was eight years old. Uh, two of my brothers had got me out in the garage smoking a bong. That was the first time I ever used marijuana. I'll never forget it. I loved it. Randy's brothers hid the goods in the garden out back, in their school bags, or even under the mattress. One time I found some white powder in there. It was cocaine. I didn't know what it was and I touched it and it had numbed my lips. And I was like, wow, that's some strange stuff. And one day I just happened to watch my brother sniff it and I sniffed some too. And the time I got to high school, I was a freshman. You know, people, people were selling it to make money. Time I was a senior in high school, I was selling big time. After graduation, Randy joined the military. I ended up being a tanker, an armor crewman, and they sent me to Fort Irwin, California. Well, up there, crystal meth was big. Well, when I got up there, I got hooked up with the wrong people. I started drinking heavier, and then I really started going on a binge with crystal meth. Oh my God, I was so addicted. It was like I couldn't live without it. I breathed it from the time I got up in the morning to the time I went to bed. I, I started selling stuff to get it. And they sent me to rehab. And eventually, they, they released me from the military. It bothered me. I was like, man, I had this great opportunity to turn my life around. Why did I get go back to doing the drugs? But it only got worse. Randy spent a year in jail for robbing a gas station. He was so high, he doesn't even remember holding a gun to the clerk's head. When he got out of jail, he overdosed. He was only 27. They went ahead and pulled a white sheet up on me because they said I was gonna die. And they called my family in. When I woke up, it was the most frightening moment because I looked down and I'm looking at a white sheet. Doctors discovered Randy was still alive. After running numerous tests, he was released. But even that near-death experience wasn't enough to scare Randy straight. Randy married, but the alcohol and drug use continued, eventually destroying the relationship. In 1997, Randy's wife left him with their two young children. And I was smoking weed, and I still did a little coke. Not like I used to, but I was still doing it, yes. The moment that changed that, all of a sudden my body collapsed to the ground. I felt something physically dragging me out of my body. And I mean, I looked up and I saw death and I saw hell in his eyes. And it had these huge horns. It, it curled around like a ram and death just filled the room. And it scared me. I could physically feel my spiritual man separating from my flesh. I didn't feel no pain, but I felt it leaving, trembling in fear. And immediately I fell on my face and I cried out, Jesus. I said, forgive me of my sins. God, help me with my addictions. Take it all away. Just don't let me go to hell, please. I was begging. I was crying. I did everything I knew. And as soon as I looked at the door, my door opened and I saw this long, white, glowing robe, white. There's just no white in this world you can describe it. 
I knew without a doubt that the moment I cried out for Jesus, that God had showed up right there and saved me at the moment I cried out. From that moment, uh, man, I just wanted to know God. I wanted to know Jesus. I wanted to know this one who, when I knew without a doubt I was going to hell, came for me. Immediately, Randy's craving for drugs and alcohol was replaced with a hunger and thirst for Jesus. I travel and share what God brought me from, what I went through, what it will do to you, and how Christ is the answer. When you call on that name Jesus, He is there right there. And He is ready to receive you and to forgive you of all your sins. Jesus is ready to receive you and to forgive all your sins. Randy called out to Jesus and immediately his life was changed. That same Jesus can do the same for you. He did it for Ian McCormick. Ian didn't know that in a few hours he would be lying in a morgue, killed by the poison stings of five box jellyfish. But what happened in those few hours changed his life for eternity. Uh, very much a non-Christian, um, partying, uh, traveling, surfing, nightclubs. So religion was something I thought old people were involved in, and I just thought it was a grandmother and old ladies. Ian McCormick loved the ocean. He was an avid diver, but nothing prepared him for what he was about to encounter. Ian was stung by five box jellyfish, one can kill a person in four minutes, and he wasn't ready to die. When I was hit, the fisherman turned white and said, Ian, one of these will kill you. And I could feel the poison moving quickly into my body, and I knew I had very little time. And by the time they got me into the ambulance, I was completely paralyzed. Uh, so I was frightened, so I mean, you know, I thought, well, perhaps I won't make it. Is there life after death? And, as I'm questioning all these things, my mother appears in a clear vision in front of me, on her knees praying. I didn't realize, but back in New Zealand, my mother was the only Christian. God revealed my face to her and said, your outer son Ian is nearly dead. Pray for him now. And she's saying, call out to God. No matter how far from God you are, son, um, he will forgive you. And so I asked God to forgive me and forgive others who have sinned against you. And, and I thought, well, I can do that. And then God showed me two faces of people I had difficulty forgiving. And I was, I had, I, I chose to forgive them. The peace that came in has mm -hmm. never left me in 28 years. Well, I knew I was, I'd given my heart to God and there was a peace had come, but my body was still dying. And they got me into the hospital. I could feel myself coming out of my body. I could hear them talking and um, saying, we can, that's all we can do for you is they shove an anti-serum and neurotoxin into me. And I thought, well, I'll stay awake all night, but I just had no strength. I remember shutting my eyes, thinking, well, I'll gather some more strength. And as it happened, the machine to monitor my heart flatlined, and I was pronounced dead. And so I'm next minute out of that hospital in complete darkness. And then I could feel evil, the most intense evil. It was like invisible eyes were looking at me. It was like a spiritual darkness. And I heard men screaming out of the darkness, saying, shut up. You deserve to be here. I said, deserve to be where? Another man in front of me, you're in hell. Thinking, well, God's every right to send me here, and yet I reflected on the fact that I had prayed in the ambulance. The next minute, radiant light pierces mm. through the darkness and draws me out. And then I see this tunnel of light. What's that? I'm now drawn into this narrow tunnel. Jesus said, small is the way, narrow is the way. And I move down this tunnel of light, the speed of light. Waves of radiance come up and saw the full radiance and glory of God. It just covered the heavens. So here I am trying to reflect on, is this real? I mm -hmm. responded back and said, well, look, if I'm out of my body, I wish to return. He said, Ian, if you return, you must see in a new light. I said, well, are you the true light? His response to me was, Ian, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1, 5. God is light. I'm thinking, well, darkness, I've just come from that. And they called it hell. It's just the kingdom of heaven. It's that almighty God. And I was shaken. I thought, he knows my name. 
He knows my thought before I even speak. Then he must see all my sins. And I'm not a good man. And I cried like a child as waves of love and acceptance which came into me. I said, well, God, you can't love me, and started telling him my sins. And each sin I told him, more love. So I walked into this cloud, and as I did, my hand disappeared, and then I put my face in, and I couldn't see my own spiritual body. It had been eclipsed by the radiance. It was like veils of miniature stars. As I moved through these veils, I could feel the light that I'd stepped into, and it was now healing my heart of hearts, my broken heart. The cloud began to part, and I saw Jesus with his hands outstretched, bare feet, dazzling white robes. It's as though he had taken this cloud and clothed himself in garments of, of this cloud of light. And as I looked towards the face of the Lord, the radiance, the source of all the light was coming out of his face. You knew if he spoke, constellations, galaxies would come into existence. Him, I can see a whole new world opening up behind him. It's as though he's been a door of light. And as he's opening this doorway into eternity, I can see fields, grass with the same radiance and glory that's upon him right across the pasture. The flowers, the crystal clear river, trees along both sides, mountains, blue sky, rolling hills. As I'm standing there, I knew I'm home. I just begin to step forward and Jesus came right back in front, the door closed as he said, now yeah, now that you've seen, do you wish to remain here or do you wish to return? I said, remain here. I said, I've known to go back for, no one loves me, um, you love me. And I look back to say goodbye, cruel world, and the Lord showed me my mother, the one person I loved and honored. I thought, if I pass through into eternity now, Will she know that I prayed in that ambulance? Will she have any concept that her prayers helped her son to give his heart to the Lord in his dying seconds? Will she have any way she would know this? I thought, she will not. I thought, how selfish would it be for me to enter eternity? My mother has to bury me and think for all intents and purposes, she lost her son to hell. I said, Lord, I want to go back. He said, Ian, if you return, you must see things in a new light from an eternal heavenly perspective, not a temporary earthly one. I look back again, my father, my brother, my sister, hundreds of